This video is inspired by content made by another content creator here on YouTube, The Drag Detective, who dives deep into the rickery of the show RuPaul's Drag Race. If you like this video, check out his channel by clicking the link in the description. Thanks for watching. It's no question that for any reality TV show, what you see on the screen is never exactly what actually happened. While the reality genre, considering the name, is supposed to give the illusion of realism and present a convincing story, no matter what, anything on television is going to have a level of fakeness to it. However, since programs rarely show you what happens behind the scenes, people don't really take the time to acknowledge this. Mnet is a Korean broadcasting network famously known for being unfair in their competition programs. From the rigging of the produce series to the alleged payola behind awards given at events such as Mama or M Countdown, for a few years now, people have had a lot of reason to be suspicious when Mnet says they're gonna play fair. So, when they announced the airing of a new survival show, Girls Planet 999, skeptics around the world were already assuming the show would be rigged. I mean, it had been revealed that throughout the produce series, over 10 contestants had been unfairly eliminated, with 6 being directly rigged out of the groups they were competing to debut in, simply because Mnet didn't want them in the final lineups. So who was to say that they weren't going to do it again? But then, throughout the airing of Girls Planet 999, and even the successful debut of the created group Kepler, the general consensus from fans worldwide is that Mnet did not directly tamper with the votes. The debut of contestants who people thought Mnet didn't like, such as Choi Yujin or Hyunning Bahie, and the elimination of ones who were believed to be their favorites like Kim Bora and Kim Soo Yeon, led online speculators to think that for once, Mnet actually followed through on their promise to play fair. And to an extent, I agree. I agree that the votes themselves were probably not rigged, and the results of the show were accurately based on votes from people around the world. But I think this has caused people to overlook some of the other ways Mnet didn't play fair. Girls Planet 999 had some of, if not the, most obvious production bias that I've ever seen, not only in a K-pop survival show, but also reality television worldwide and it's baffling to me how it didn't cause more upset from the fans. I know it's like a year too late, but in today's video, I'll be doing an analysis on the indirect rigory seen within Girls Planet and be looking at things from the point of view of the production team, the people who were in charge of not only creating the story and the narrative of the show, but also the ones who made the decisions regarding what to and not to include within the one and a half to two and a half hour long episodes. I'll be trying to explain exactly what they were trying to do just by gathering context clues from the show and how how the editing and decision making by the production team was unfairly rigged. And if things are confusing now, don't worry because it'll make sense when we actually get into the video. But first, I want to thank the sponsors of this video, Fashion Chingu. Fashion Chingu is an online clothing store that recreates the fashion of famous K-pop idols and K-drama actors. With a huge variety of groups and styles, from the fierce fashion of G-Idol's latest comeback nude, to the adorable style of TXT's Bumgyu, you can find something to match your wardrobe no matter what kind of clothes you enjoy. Fashion Chingu is also holding a special Black Friday sale from November 21st to the 26th, with 25% off every item. This is an amazing deal, with free shipping on orders over $60 and almost worldwide shipping too. So make sure to check out Fashion Chingu's Black Friday sale while you still can. Thank you so much Fashion Chingu for supporting this this video, and without further ado, let's talk about the rigging of Girls Planet 999. So before we start getting into the actual riggery, I want to lay the ground for the direction this video is going to take by analyzing the mindset of Mnet going into this survival show. So bear with me for a minute here. Imagine you're a part of Mnet's team. Your company was just recently exposed for rigging the produce series, and you lost a huge amount of support from people who watched your survival shows. And yet, the decision to create another competition was approved, and you're a part of the team to make sure everything goes smoothly. See. Now that you've already been exposed for rigging once, you can't really make any production favoritism or riggery obvious. But at the same time, you want to create a show with a satisfying story and your end goal is to make the debut lineup as marketable as possible. So that Kepler can make money that goes to your paycheck. What do you do to make people think that the show is more fair than it actually is? Well, I think the method that Mnet took to make it seem like they weren't rigging the show was taking contestants they didn't care about and making it seem like they were the favorites. To elaborate on my claim, let's dive into the actual show by talking about the initial contestant evaluations that happened before the show even aired. If you don't know what this is, let me explain. The first episode of Girls Planet aired on August 6th of 2021. 
However, in late July, a couple of weeks before the show, Mnet released videos of all 99 contestants dancing to the show's theme song, Oh Oh Oh. And these videos were apparently used to rank all 99 contestants. All 99 were separated into three equal groups of 33 based on their ethnicity, either Chinese, Japanese, or Korean. And based on their OOO dance performances, they were given a rank of 1 to 33 in their groups, apparently evaluated by both their peers and the mentors. The mentors essentially just being judges, a la Simon Cowell on The X Factor, or Nicki Minaj on American Idol. <laughs> And in episodes 1 and 2, all the contestants came in wearing these rankings across their shirts. Obviously, with the audience being presented this arbitrary ranking that happened before the show, and with most of us not watching many of the OOO dance videos, there was speculation that the high-ranking contestants were Mnet's favorites right off the bat. And people assumed that every girl who ranked low would be eliminated early, and the higher-ranking ones would make it far. I really believe that Mnet knew this would happen, considering half the ranking was decided by the mentors, and to avoid to avoid any serious backlash, I think Emna intentionally ranked some of the contestants highly with the intention to eliminate them early. I know that sounds crazy considering the higher ranking contestants tended to be the ones who seemed the most talented out of the bunch, but I feel like from Mnet's point of view, if each of the 99 contestants were handpicked out of the hundreds and hundreds of applicants by the casting process, while sure, some of the contestants might have not been the most skilled, they probably casted enough talented people where they were fine letting go of some of them early. Because what's the harm in losing a few of the more talented ones if there's still gonna be a lot of them after the first elimination or two. Getting rid of a contestant like Murakami Yume in the first round who ranked fourth out of the Japanese contestants would serve as a sort of shock elimination, making people think, hey, even though the mentors, and by extension Mnet, like this girl, the viewers vote is actually what decides the result in the end. Making people think that the show might not be as rigged as they thought it would be. And all Mnet has to do to throw people off the scent of the actual rigging happening behind the scenes is give some random trainees that they don't care about high initial rankings and then just not give them screen time afterwards so they don't get votes. And speaking of screen time, that leads us right into our next section. In my opinion, the most blatant and obvious riggery in the entire show that I'm surprised wasn't talked about more was the screen time distribution throughout the first two episodes. Episode 1 and 2 consisted of the quote-unquote evaluation performances, where contestants were split into 32 small groups consisting of 1 to 6 members of the same ethnicity, and the contestants who stood out the most within their groups would be nominated as a quote-unquote top 9 candidate, who had the highest chances of making it into the final debut lineup. First of all, tell me if this sounds crazy or not. The first two episodes totaled 250 minutes of runtime, and there were 32 performances that were around 2 minutes each in length, some even shorter, meaning that there was at most 64 minutes of performances to show if they wanted to include every single one. Definitely doesn't sound like a crazy big job, right? But for some reason, Mnet decided to cut around 10 of these performances from the show, showing either like a 5 second clip of the performance, or maybe not even showing it at all. I don't know about the rest of you, but for me, this is very obvious evidence of who Mnet does and doesn't like, and is even bigger evidence of riggery within the show. I mean, the first couple of episodes is usually all it takes for people to figure out who they want to support and vote for, so by leaving some of the girls out of the first evaluations, Mnet was basically saying, hey, we don't care about you, so you're not gonna get any screen time. Of course, the editors are responsible for creating a storyline in each episode and making the footage more entertaining for the viewer, so I understand that'll take up some of the runtime, but let's do a little math. In order to make everything as fair as possible, let's take the 250 minutes of runtime and subtract 3 minutes for each group to both show their performance and let them do like a minute long introduction. 3 times 32 is 96, 250 minus 96 is 156, so if the editors wanted to give each group a fair share of screen time, they still had 156 minutes to tell whatever story they wanted to. But as we all know by now, they didn't do that and that's because they have obvious favorites. Mnet wanted to push specific contestants into the foreground of the audience's mind, and that's why they spent an extra 4 or 5 minutes on different groups, leaving others with maybe only a minute, or at worst, barely even 5 seconds. Meaning that some of the girls not only didn't get to show their performance, but they didn't even get to share their name. So if Mnet actually wanted people to vote for them, then how are they supposed to do that if they don't know who the contestants are? I think the more obvious answer is that Mnet 
didn't want people to vote for some of them, because they never wanted them to make it into Kepler. Instead, the editors gave their favorite contestants extended backstories and introductions to make sure that they got votes instead. I know earlier I said that people think Mnet didn't like this contestant, but I actually disagree with those people. So to use an example, let's use the very obvious case of Mnet rigging the show in favor of Choi Yujin. Even though Yujin was my one pick and I voted for her every single time throughout the entirety of the show, I could admit that she got some very obvious favoritism, at least in the first round. Despite having a solo performance, meaning that there was only one person that Mnet needed to cover in her segment, Yujin's bubble pop evaluation was dedicated 8 minutes of episode 2's runtime, with 2 of the 8 being used to show her performance, and the other 6 were used to tell her story of looking for a second chance at the idol industry. Compare this to contestant Shim Sung-un. sung -un had a similar story of coming from an unsuccessful idol group, that group being the now disbanded bandit. She performed solo, and her story was that she was looking for a second chance. But sung -un was given a one-minute segment, with an insane amount of that one minute being used to show the reactions of the mentors and the other contestants, instead of sung -un herself. I mean, the girl didn't even get to say her own name on the show. That part was cut out, and if that's not obvious favoritism and riggery, I don't know what is. If Mnet didn't like the idea of Yujin being in Kepler, they wouldn't have given her an 8 minute introductory segment. And if Mnet wanted to give sung -un a fair shot, they wouldn't have cut out 50% of her performance and not let her say her own name. Some may say that this way of editing didn't matter that much in the end, but if you rewatch the first two episodes, every single contestant who ended up making it into the final lineup of Kepler had their first evaluation performance fully integrated into the show, and most of them got an extra background segment as well. Yujin had her second chance story, Yeso had her third chance story, Mashiro had her second chance story after almost debuting in Itzy, Chaehyun had her second chance story after almost debuting in Espa, and Bahie had a segment dedicated to her relationship with her brother. Do you see where I'm going with this? Three of the other girls who didn't really get a backstory in the first two episodes were Dayeon, Xiaoting, and Hikaru. All we really learned about them personally was that they were hard workers and they were talented, but these are also the three girls who got first place in the initial evaluations, with them being ranked number one within Korea, China, and Japan respectively. So they don't really need a backstory immediately to stand out, and I think them being given first place is kind of a sign of production favoritism because any of them easily could have been given second or third. But giving them first makes them stand out from the crowd more than any other rank. They're seen as the most talented, and that's gonna bring them the most fans when it comes to fans who just want the best group possible. So I think they were production favorites from the get-go as well. The only big question mark in my book is Youngin, who didn't get a backstory and ranked 10th out of 33 after the initial evaluation. However, her segment did end up being around 5 minutes long, and she got a lot more screen time than her duo partner Yoon Jia, so she was not disliked by Mnet at all, maybe just not an immediate frontrunner in their eyes. Still, all of the debuting contestants got a lot more screen time in just the first two episodes than a majority of the other 90, which is a pretty clear sign of favoritism. This of course raises the question of how they were able to get away with this obvious riggery. And I think Mnet was able to pull the metaphorical wool over our eyes because they did a pretty good job at pretending these contestants weren't their production favorites. Along with the girls who did end up debuting, random contestants like Kubo Reina who was eliminated in round 2, Kashida Ririka eliminated in round 3, and the Liang twins who were both gone by round 2 were given backstories as well. However, in retrospect, it's clear that none of them were production favorites, versus the members of the debut lineup who were given sad stories that drew sympathy from voters. Kubo Reina's backstory told us that she was a good singer and that she's been practicing since age 2, and there's not much there to develop an emotional attachment between her and the viewer. Compared to say, Chaehyun, who was so close to debuting in Espa, but was cut at the last minute. That is a backstory that's actually gonna matter to the fans, and I think Mnet knew this. So I would argue that backstories like Reina's were put in as decoy material to distract viewers from the actual favoritism going on, and make it seem like the distribution of screen time is fair. 
even if the quality of screen time between the contestants is different. Other contestants like Rurika and the Leung twins, who got pretty nice backstories, were also very obvious filler characters who weren't taken too seriously by production. Because after being shown the sympathetic stories of Rurika being eliminated from Niziyu's survival show and the Leung twins growing up together, we immediately learned that they weren't very good at performing to say the least. They really struggle in the vocal department, and this kind of immediately turns viewers away from seriously voting for them, and makes them feel more like joke characters than actual contenders for the debut lineup. Seeing as none of them made it past round 3, I think my theory kind of holds up. However, once again, giving screen time to these underdog characters makes Mnet seem more fair and makes other people less likely to call out screen time favoritism, which is the end goal of these segments. Another notable instance where Mnet pretended to care about a trainee who was really just filler is when Ayana Kuwahara was chosen as a top 9 contender in episode 2 by the mentors. I doubt most of you know who Ayana is, so let me refresh your memories. Ayana Kuwahara was initially rank 11 within the Japanese group, and her evaluation song was Nonstop by Oh My Girl. Let me play a small segment of her performance. <laughs> If you remember her now, you probably don't remember her being one of the best within the first two episodes, and that's because her evaluation segment was about 30 seconds long. Her name was never mentioned in that 30 seconds, and the most notable thing in that half minute that was said about her was that she was cute. Not necessarily a good introduction in the show because viewers have learned nothing about you. Obviously, she wasn't a production favorite since her performance was cut, so I think she was chosen to be a top 9 contender to once again throw viewers viewers off the scent of Riggery. Of course, it was alluded to that the mentors personally chose the top 9, but I feel like that was just what they wanted it to look like. It's more likely that there was a higher up making these decisions behind the scenes, and the mentors were just doing what they were told to do. Obviously, if the top 9 consisted of only contestants who were given fully fleshed out backstories and full length evaluations, people would call Mnet out for Riggery. So what do they do? Give a random trainee who got 30 seconds of screen time a top 9 position because then you can't say that it's favoritism, because no one knew who Ayana Kuwahara was, and therefore no one thought she was getting favoritism from Mnet. That way, when the viewer votes come in during episodes 5, 8, and 12, it becomes less suspicious when the contestants who have the personal backstories, who are presented as amazing performers, who have gotten actual screen time, take those top 9 spots and eventually debut in the group. The next thing I want to discuss is the idea that it wasn't only the nine members of Kepler who were pushed and had the show rigged in their favor. Along with the final lineup of Kepler, a lot of other trainees got significant screen time in episodes 1 and 2. Contestants like Kawaguchi Yurina, Su Ruichi, and others got decent screen time and backstories as well. So I think Mnet did want us to take note of these trainees and maybe even vote for them as well. I actually think there were a bunch of different contestants who were favored by Mnet to debut, such as Kim Soo-yeon and Kim Bor who I mentioned before, and Gwyn Maya or Nana Kashana. And even though none of these mentioned trainees made it into Kepler, the reason why Mnet wanted to push more than 9 contestants is because they wanted insurance. As I mentioned before, or I don't think Mnet changed the results of the final voting at all, because, as we've said, they didn't want to get in trouble with the law again. So, in order to ensure that none of the girls Mnet didn't like made it into Kepler, they pushed a larger group of potential debut candidates to be the fan favorites. As you've probably noticed, every single person I've mentioned made it all the way to the finale of the show, and... Sorry for being predictable, I do think basically everyone who made the finale were contestants Mnet would have been fine if they were in the final group. I think besides Youngun, as I mentioned before, Mnet had assumed that the other 8 members of Kepler would have probably made it into the final group as they all got personal content and had proven their talents early on in the season. However, though they might not have been their first pick, I'm pretty sure Mnet would have been fine with any of the others in the finale debuting as well, with maybe one or two exceptions. 
Since they could edit their absolute favorites in the best way possible, it was likely that they could predict who would end up making the top 9, but you never really know who's going to become popular within the fandom, because fans always latch on to the smallest things. Going back to the Produce series, in Produce 48, because of Mnet's editing, they were able to get 9 out of the 11 contestants that they wanted to debut in the top 11. But because of unpredicted fan support, underdogs Chowan and Gaan, who they didn't want, ended up getting more votes than they needed to debut. But back then, Mnet could just rig them out. They weren't willing to risk that here. So instead, they edited the show the best they possibly could to get their favorites in, but made it so it would be fine if one or two were replaced. It kind of felt like Mnet separated them into two groups their absolute favorites, and the alternates that could have possibly made it in. The favorites basically being everyone in Kepler, and the one Mnet favorite I think actually ended up being eliminated was Suruichi, and everyone else in the finale were alternates, with the one alternate who actually made it into Kepler, don't kill me, this is not me hating on her, I think it was Youngin. Don't get me wrong, I really like Youngin, and she's actually one of my favorite members of Kepler. I just don't know that she was one of Mnet's favorites. It just kind of makes sense in my mind that I feel like Mnet were shooting for a 5 Korean, 2 Chinese, 2 Japanese member group. Again, this isn't me saying that's what I wanted to happen, that's what I think Mnet wanted to happen. Please don't send hate to Youngin or think I dislike her, please. But anyways, speaking of this ratio between Korean and non-Korean contestants, another reason I believe this is the composition of the final 18. If I recall correctly, after Gwyn Maya received the planet pass which saved her from elimination in round 3, every single Korean contestant who could have made the finale did make the finale making it so the Chinese and Japanese contestants who remained, when combined, had an equal number as the Korean contestants. So it was 9 Koreans and 9 non-Koreans. At that point, they're basically guaranteed to have a debut group consisting of mostly Korean contestants, but a few Chinese and Japanese members, which is pretty transparently what Mnet wanted, but initially that's apparently not what happened because remember when Mnet sent out that emergency announcement when 8 out of the top 9 were Korean? I think it was a day or two before the finale that Mnet did a surprise livestream where they announced the current top 9, and people, including me, pretty much unanimously agreed that they did that because they realized the non-Korean contestants weren't getting enough votes. It was every Korean contestant except Bora, I believe, in the top 9, and Ruichi was the only outlier in ninth place. We all know Mnet wanted a mainly Korean lineup, but they were going to be in huge trouble if it was only Korean, and thankfully after that announcement was created, people panic voted, and we ended up getting Mashiro, Hikaru, and Xiaoting in the final lineup. I know I didn't cover every single round or every single episode of the show in this video, but I think the rigging can sort of be summed up and understood just by deeply analyzing the first couple of episodes. Most of the rigging lies in Mnet giving their favorites more screen time and pretending that it's not unfair, which is what they did throughout most of the season, like when they kept putting Korean contestants at the forefront of the plotline, but because people were forced to vote for contestants from each group, this rigging wasn't apparent until the end. Because non-Korean contestants contestants kept getting in the top 9 due to filler votes, and only a few non-Korean trainees were people's one picks, as we saw in the finale. I guess what I want people to take away from this video is that rigging doesn't always have to come in the form of vote tampering. Screen time and editing is a huge form of ruggery in a competition that is based on reception from viewers of the show. And we should recognize Mnet's bias in these situations, especially with Boys Planet coming out next year. I hope you can all keep this in mind. And that just about marks the end of this video. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. I was thinking of also diving into things such as the evil edits of contestants like Chai Bing, Fu Yanning, and Kim Seyan, but that didn't necessarily tie in to what I wanted to talk about today, and this video did sort of end up with me going on my own little tangent, but it's whatever. If you guys want though, comment if you want me to make a part 2 of this, and I totally will. Before we go, I'd like to once again thank The Drag Detective for inspiring this video, and also make sure you follow me on Instagram. You can see my user name on the screen, but if you need to hear it, it's Planet Minje with no space between Planet and Minje. Last thing, as always, I'd like to thank OP Jin Itzy, Wu Twice Tease, Dog, Zeus112, Jackie, ZVH, Yin Latte, Soda Scribbles, Shiny, Mizu Monorovie, Fix on June, Cassie, Gav, Chili's Cafe, Ale, Che, 97th Heaven, Frosty Plays, Julian Zalazar, Alpha Fox, Edgy Does Things, Namjoon's Last AirPods, Q Can Love, Kaylin Caster, Sanarinth, 
Flo, O99, Wu Youngi, Mel T, Kieran Johnston, Frago Bobo, Sun Me Shine, J, Julia Peterson, Stay22, Damien J, Lennon, Silverwind, Adifa N, Jed, and Just Softness for being channel members. And if you want to become a channel member, just click the join button down below. If you decide to join, you can get access to things like our Discord server and my podcast, which I upload two episodes of a month. Thank you all again so much for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Peace out.